How much money is borrowed and how it will be spent will be up for debate in the coming legislative session. Joining me in the studio to talk about the bonding bill, the new state flag and seal, and more, is the Lieutenant Governor of the state of Minnesota, Peggy Flanagan, thank you for joining me. Thanks so much for having me, happy to be here. Almost half of the bonding proposal, $442 million, is directed to improving existing buildings, with nearly half of that, $200 million, going specifically to higher education campuses uh, at the University of Minnesota and Minnesota State. Why the emphasis on upgrading existing buildings rather than new construction? I think it's really important to Minnesotans and taxpayers to ensure that we are maintaining the investments that they've already made instead of knocking things down and building uh, things brand new. Um, we also know that we've really gone big in the you know the last legislative session. We had uh, a significant bonding bill. We've gotten resources from the Biden Harris administration, almost a billion dollars uh, to make sure that we're making these investments in in infrastructure. So we thought it was important to just maintain uh, what we already have and we think that that's uh, what's appropriate for, for this year. Uh, the remainder of the proposal would go to clean water efforts, mm -hmm. public safety improvements, affordable housing, and local governments. Now, any bonding bill will need Republican votes, as you well know, and Senator Karen Housley is the Republican lead of the Senate Capital Investment Committee. She raised concerns about the lack of funding in your package for roads and wastewater treatment. Do those concerns need to be added to the mix? Well, we have over 200 million uh, that is set aside for uh, clean water and roads. And so, you know, that investment is there, again, building on the foundation of the investments that we made the last session. Um, you know, uh, but I think I'm interested if, if uh, Senator Housley has additional resources that she wants to, to spend in the bonding bill, we're gonna talk about it. I think, uh, you know, as a recovering legislator, I know uh, that the proposal that the governor and I put out is not the one that we will end up with at the end of the session. It's a, a conversation. It's a bipartisan uh, conversation. We simply think it's important to uh, maintain those investments that we've already made and that there's an opportunity to see if we can do more uh, and we'll get there. Um, I'd like to shift gears now and talk about some of the historic changes of the past few years. And one has become so customary that I frankly take it for granted, and that is that there is always a white Earth Nation flag that is displayed along with the United States flag and the Minnesota State flag. Those three flags together, what does that mean for you personally and for indigenous people in Minnesota? Well, I think it's a powerful reminder uh, that Native people are contemporary people, but that we've always been a part of Minnesota. Uh, having the White Earth Nation flag in the reception room uh, is important uh, to me because I'm a dual citizen. I'm a citizen of the United States. Uh, I'm also a, a citizen of, of White Earth or the Minnesota Chippewa tribe. And I think that that matters. But I'll be really honest with you. Uh, it was the governor who said, why don't you put the White Earth flag in here? And it was, to be honest with you, something that I, I hadn't even thought would be possible. Um, and that has been uh, so much of what we've been able to do uh, together and to do with our tribal state uh, relations office, um, codifying tribal consultation uh, into law. The tribal state relations training is, is now mandatory uh, for every uh, leader and every state agency. Um, and the partnerships that we've developed with tribes have been incredibly powerful. Uh, so I think it's just a representation of that, and I'm proud to fly that flag in our office. Uh, this segues nicely into the selections by the State Emblems Redesign Commission, who were charged with choosing a new state flag and a new state seal. The new flag is an eight-pointed star on a dark blue K-shaped background with the remaining space a lighter blue. The new state seal features a loon and the Dakota phrase, Minnesota Makoche, which means the land where the water reflects the skies. Unless the legislature steps in, these will become the new emblem, emblems of Minnesota on Statehood Day, May 11th. What's your take? I'm really excited about it. Um, I know that there has been a lot of chatter uh, about uh, the flag in particular, uh, but for me, uh, as a Native woman, uh, anything is an improvement over uh, a Native person being driven off their land and having a rifle pointed directly at them. Um, I think if you do a little research into the history of that flag, you'll see um, that uh, Native people across the state of Minnesota are right to say that there needed to be a change. Um, the state seal, I 
I think is incredible to have the Dakota language um, on that seal, to have a loon or a manch uh, in Ojibwe, uh, along with uh, wild rice with the, you know, uh, Minoman, the state grain, I think is a really powerful representation of who we are. I'm excited to put that state seal on everything um, where I would have shied away from that previously. And I also think, you know, with the flag, it's beautiful. Um, when we see it, uh, I see some of the images of it flying. Um, it, it, you, the Minnesota part, I think, really, uh, really stands out. Um, we'll get used to it, and I think change is hard. Uh, but as Minnesotans, um, you know, we adapt and we move forward together, and I think that's what we're going to do here too. Uh, these are examples of change in visual representation in the state of Minnesota. To that can be added new laws that will require further education among teachers to incorporate more indigenous history into school curriculum. Uh, there are also new standards involving ethnic studies that are going to roll out soon. How do you think these changes will impact the lives of native people and people of color in Minnesota? Well, I think, uh, you know, it certainly will impact everyone's life in the state of Minnesota. Uh, for Native folks, this is something tribal leaders had asked us about for a long time. You know, that oftentimes we'd get to uh, become adults, right, or you come to the capital even, and uh, there's a need for Indigenous 101. Uh, wouldn't it be better if we simply just taught our young people about the folks who have always lived here and still live here? Uh, I think it, it makes a, a big difference. I also think for ethnic studies and for students of color, seeing themselves reflected in the, their teachers, seeing themselves reflected in their curriculum, um, really demonstrates that the educational system values them and therefore in turn they value their education. That certainly was my experience once I got to the University of Minnesota and uh, was an American Indian Studies minor. And then I just say everyone in Minnesota benefits because, you know, we're better prepared for the world around us, for the future workforce, for the future of the state of Minnesota, if we have more knowledge about the truth, the history, and the people who live in our state. I think it's good for everybody, and I'm excited um, for my own daughter to start, uh, you know, learning uh, more about uh, where she lives, who she is, and who the people are around her. You've often been one to lead by sharing your own story. Uh, for example, you highlighted your experience as a school kid with a lunch ticket that looked different from other kids in advocating for universal free meals for all school kids. Uh, more recently, when celebrating a new law that became effective January 1st that prohibits employers from asking about salary history of potential employees, you talked about your own experience with that that led you to accept a position for $40,000 less than your predecessor. Would our political climate be different if more people spoke from personal experience and less from a sense of ideology? Yes, <laughs> that's the short answer. Um, but I do think, I think it's changing, right? I think the, um, the legislature itself, right, looks more like Minnesota. And I think that uh, women leaders oftentimes um, will connect by telling stories. And I think it makes a difference. Uh, you know, knowing that you have something in common with someone, um, showing a little vulnerability, I think is the way that we build compassion for each other, but is also the way that we build support for the things that we, we want to work on. Um, having, uh, you know, leaders who more accurately reflect the communities that they seek to represent is good for democracy. Um, and I think I just want people to know that they're not alone. And I want people to know that there may be self-imposed barriers that they have put on themselves and say, I can't sit at this table, I can't run for this, I'm not supposed to be a part of this because of something that's happened in their life or their past. And I would argue that you know the very opposite is true. Um, those rich experiences uh, make us better leaders. Um, and when you have uh, lived experience, you should be able to bring that to the table and then we get better results in policy too. Lieutenant Governor Peggy Flanagan, what a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks so much.